There are many ways of travel in Dungeons and Dragons. Well, actually, in the big scope of things, there really are only two. You can either teleport to a location or physically travel to a location. Now, this is pretty straightforward in the normal mundane world where your campaign is probably set, but it can get complicated when you add in heavens and hells. Getting to a heaven can be done through teleportation using the plane shift spell, but most times you'll find this way to be blocked, whether because you don't have the right attunement to the plane or because the god of that plane prevents plane shifts into its domain. A very common defensive tactic. Physical travel to a heaven can be done through the Astral Projection spell, where you will be disjointed from the physical world in order to travel the streets of the astral plane where you will have to physically find the special and unique opening into the plane that you're looking for. This we all know, none of this is new information. But what if I want to find myself in another world? Not a heaven or a hell or an elemental plane, but a different world altogether. What if I want to go from my house in Waterdeep to the world of Greyhawk or the newly released world of the Critical Role cast, the planet of Exandria? The answer is you can. You can literally go from any 5th edition campaign into the continent of the Wildemount of the world created by Matthew Mercer and in a legitimate and canon way. If you wanted to teleport there, you could do that probably via the plane of Outlands in the city of Sigil, where you can find portals to other worlds. But that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to explain how you could get to these other worlds physically. Where are these worlds in relation to yours, in relation to the Forgotten Realms, in relation to Waterdeep? Let's talk about space. Let's say that I, as a mage, cast the fly spell on myself and simply fly up as high up as I can. What would happen to me the second that I leave the atmosphere? Space in Dungeons and Dragons works differently than it does in real life, and in general it solves two of the three major problems with space exploration. For one, there is no pressure problem in Dungeons and Dragons. In real life, if you were to submit yourself to space, you would find that any oxygen in your body will attempt to forcefully leave it, bloating you and crushing your lungs. Any water or sweat or really any kind of liquid in your skin would start immediately boiling. So all the liquid in your mouth and eyes would start burning and boiling you alive. In D&D this doesn't happen. Space is merely just a lack of atmosphere and there is no super low pressure. The second problem is temperatures. Real life space is really cold to the point where you would actually freeze solid if you were to simply float in the vacuum for a long period of time. In D&D the temperatures tend to be quite warm in general to the point where heavy insulated suits are not needed. What these two solved problems produce is a space where you can literally float freely in without needing any protection at all. A person could literally float forever in the vacuum of space without any problems at all, wearing nothing but a leather vest, a pair of pants and shoes. That is, provided that he had oxygen to survive. Oxygen is the one major problem of space that regulates everything that you can do, and it's going to be the main factor in deciding whether or not you can or cannot do something, or better yet, how far you might be able to go and travel in space. So, back to my question, me as a mage flying past the planet's atmosphere would find that space is actually quite nice until I would start to run out of air. I would notice that I would bring with me a small pocket of air into space, but the pocket of air would be so small that it would only last me for about two minutes. After those two minutes, the air envelope would spoil, but I would still be able to breathe it at least for another two minutes. During those last two minutes, I would notice myself getting mentally and physically impaired because I'm breathing fouled air. After those full four minutes, I would notice my pocket of air would become now deadly, having exhausted most of the oxygen in it. It would now be a pocket of carbon dioxide which is poisonous. Breathing it would make me fall unconscious until I choke to death. If I was immune to poison, I could probably breathe it in for a few more seconds before the lack of oxygen would suffocate me. Now the reason that I would bring in this pocket of air with me once I leave the atmosphere is because of the way gravity works in Dungeons and Dragons, which is also different from real life. Quote, Gravity is an all-or-nothing proposition. Either it is there at full strength or it is not there at all. Gravity always exerts the same force whether the body creating it is the size of a whale, the planet Toril, or a massive gas giant planet." End quote. 
This means that the second that I leave my planet's atmosphere, I would start floating in the vacuum of space, rather than being taken back down to the planet. The gravity of the planet would stop working its effects on me the second that I leave its air pocket. Me as a person would then create my own mini force of gravity which would steal air from the planet as I leave it. Now, medium-sized creatures do not have a big enough size to create a true gravity field. For that, you would need to be a creature larger than 25 feet in any length. So, for example, a cloud giant or a storm giant would do the trick. If a storm giant were to be floating in space and I were to collide with it, I would be literally attracted to the giant through gravity as if he was an entire planet, though the range of this pool would be proportional to its size. But if I was attracted to his gravity plane, to the gravity plane of the giant, I could literally walk along his back without falling as if he was just floor. Here's a picture to explain how gravity fields work in D&D, using a Mind Flayer Nautiloid ship. The gist of it is that the keel of the ship, or the creature, that generally being the longest running axis of the object, will be what provides the gravity plane and that plane will run adjacent to the keel for the entire diameter of the air envelope. Now in English that means that the longest part of the ship will be where the gravity is. The thing to keep in mind here though is that the line that defines the gravity will run even farther than the ship itself. So using this ship as an example, if I were to jump from the edge of the ship into space, I would actually be pulled by the gravity down to here, but then I would be pulled up by the gravity up here, and then down here again, and then up here again. The gravity plane pushes to the center in both directions. Eventually, if I were to continue this, I would actually balance out in the middle, and then very slowly I would be pushed out of the air envelope. Slowly and slowly I would be pushed away, until I leave the envelope and the gravity field and I would basically be ejected. When it comes to multiple ships and or objects, the bigger object will always be the one who uses its gravity to attract the other. The smaller object's gravity will never affect the bigger one. So if I am riding a giant in space and we come in contact with a ship's gravity, I would actually be disjointed from the back of the giant and we would both fall into the ship and crash in it. Many pirates and adventurers actually use this to their advantage in space combat by throwing bombs into space and hoping that the bombs catch the gravity of the other ship and then slam in it. Other captains use it in other ways, specifically dwarves who have enormous mountain ships. They use their enormous ships to grab smaller ships into their orbit and then have them ram into their own mountain in order to destroy them. Now, when it comes to how much air is good enough for a person or a crew, the math is actually pretty simple. For every metric ton that the ship weighs, you can sustain a person for four to eight months. That is, four months of fresh air and four extra months of spoiled air. So a galleon in space, because it has a weight of 40 tons, could sustain a crew of 40 for four to eight months. This would have to be refreshed by actually going into a planet, taking the air out of the planet and moving out. Now, I should also mention that if a ship is in a state of emergency and has mostly fouled air, if it were to come in contact with another ship's clean air pocket, then both would share on each other's pockets. Provided that their sizes are similar, the ship with the fouled air would get comparatively refreshed, and the ship that had fresh air would get comparatively fouled. This is why it is generally very dangerous to have your ship dock on a derelict ship in space because you would actually lose your air to the atmosphere of the empty ship. That is a rookie captain's mistake. There is of course math that comes into play here with how much air you trade with another ship, but let's not get lost on the weeds here. We will talk about how these ships actually work in space further in our next video alongside what kinds of ships humans use versus mind flayers and others. Eventually we will talk about all the kinds of dangers in space, like what kind of monsters roam in space and what are the major contenders when it comes to civilizations in space. But for now, let's just assume that you have a ship and you want to get to Exandria or Everon or Ravnica. Where do you go? Here's where we expand our watch and extend it into the cosmos. Except that there really isn't a cosmos in Dungeons and Dragons. The solar system of the Forgotten Realms is encased in an odd crystal ball that we call a shell. The shell and everything inside we call a crystal sphere. 
So this here would be the crystal sphere of the Forgotten Realms, colloquially known as Realm Space. And this is actually the case for every single world in Dungeons and Dragons, whether it is Dragonlands or Greyhawk, the Forgotten Realms or any other. And this would also theoretically include any world released by Wizards of the Coast like Ravnica, Everon and now Wildemount of Exandria. Now, the crystal spheres are all separate from one another, separated by what spacefarers call the flow, and what sages and gods would name the phlogiston. The phlogiston is described as a multicolored sea upon which the crystal spheres float, a turbulent rainbow ocean of flammable ether. Quote, Phlogiston is none of the recognized four elemental matters. It is neither air nor earth, fire nor water. It cannot be reproduced or brought inside the bounds of a crystal sphere. If any attempts are made, whether by physical or magical containment, the phlogiston inexplicably dissipates, leaving no trace. Phlogiston simply cannot exist within wild space or on any surface of a planet. End quote. This gassy ether is the least understood element of the entire prime material realm and is considered to be the literal ether of all creation. Gods fear it for they cannot control it and have no power over it, but we shall talk about that also on a future video. Now this here is an example of how the entirety of the prime material realm would actually look like. Now keep in mind that th this picture is not canon. It's fan-made, but it illustrates well how the universe would look like in D&D. It is essentially a massive collection of worlds encased in crystal spheres and joined up together by rivers of phlogiston that flow in different ways. Some rivers of the ether only go one way and others go both ways, and there would be many worlds who wouldn't have rivers flowing towards them which would keep them completely isolated. Like, for example, the planet Earth, which is a literal canon place in D&D. Traveling through the phlogiston alongside the river speeds up travel, whereas going against the river makes the travel virtually impossible, like decades or even centuries worth of wasted time. To close this up, you as a traveler would have to find a ship and then sail space until you reach the end of the crystal sphere. You would then have to find a way to cross the immutable form of the shell, whether through magic or other purposes. Then you should sail the currents of the phlogiston to the desired crystal sphere that houses the world that you're seeking. You should then find a way inside of the shell and then voila, you would be in that world. Of course, this process could be a whole adventure and might take months or literal years. Using contemporary magic might actually get you from your planet and out of your world's shell in a few days time, but crossing the phlogiston to another world, well, that could take months, if not years, unless you find just the right current. But that is also for another video. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Zach Bowell, Ricardo Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Dr. Cowbell, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Schizio Boy, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Kosh Bane, Doc Feeder, Brad Salazar, The Great Codini, Alyssa Russell, Major Fail Gaming, Terry Culp, Morgan McCormick, and Mediogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Anyways, guys, thank you so much once again. D&D uh, &D in space is really interesting, and there's a lot to cover from the different races, uh, how every race interacts with one another. Of course, the ships. The ships are really interesting because every race has its own type of ship, and... Uh, they're all really cool. <laughs> we'll also talk about how people actually, um, because it's not just about the ships, but the magic that, that uh, I guess, just fuels the ships, uh, because otherwise space travel would take forever. So we're going to talk about that on the next episode, so stay tuned. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for waiting for this video, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.